a bit about. Um, I am also a lupus warrior. Today, our speaker is Wendy Rogers. Wendy is a native Texan who holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Houston, a master's in education from the National University, and a master's of public health in, from the George Washington University. Um, she is also a lupus warrior. She has been battling lupus since 20, 2000. Did I say that right? Yeah, 2000. And um, at that time, she was a science teacher. Um, after um, she had to let that thing go, she now works for the Lupus Foundation of America. She is the director of care and support services. Um, she oversees the uh, national education program, the support groups and health education specialists. Um, pretty much most of California now, right, uh, Wendy? Yes. Um, you guys, you're gonna love her. She's a wonderful person, loving, caring, and um, I've been with the group for about six years now, and she is awesome. So without further ado, welcome everyone, Wendy Rogers. Thank you, Stephanie. I just love you so much, and I'm so honored to have you introduce me and honored to be here. I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started. And I'm so happy to see that you guys are knowledgeable about lupus. It is something very near and dear to my heart, a little bit about what happened to me. It's, I did move here from Texas, uh, well, really in 1997 and got married and uh, was working to become an eye doctor. And I decided to teach school before I applied because I was newly married. I had a daughter um, when I was about 16 years old. And so I had a, a you know, little girl with me that came and I had gotten an award to teach in a multicultural area because I taught ESL. And in that second year of teaching, I started having symptoms of lupus and that led to a, a whole devastatingly um, shocking life change um, as I had to battle and fight for my life. And um, it, it, what I didn't know is God had put me on a different trajectory than what I planned. And, you know, that's kind of how life goes. You, you plan, but, you know, God often has another plan for you. So I'm here and this is something really um, special for me. I just feel very fortunate to be a survivor. I, I spent six months in, my, in ICU fighting for my life. I had, you know, not to scare you all, but I had uh, four grand mal seizures. I had a stroke. I lost my ability to walk. Um, I had kidney failure and had to endure nine years of dialysis. And about 14 years ago, I had a kidney transplant, which thankfully put me in remission and gave me the ability to return back to work. And unbeknownst to me, when I did my public health degree, I wanted to get out of the classroom because I was always a little scared for flu season. And I said, you know, I have a different set of skills. Um, and I ended up <laughs> being asked to work at the Lupus Foundation of America. So I'm here um, as a staff person instead of a volunteer. So I feel very honored, especially to educate people within the black community. So today I, I decided to focus on one of our educational PowerPoints. Um, it's Lupus 101 and feel free if you have any questions, this is a very casual and open. I'm very uh, open about talking about myself and my journey or answering questions. So please don't feel shy. If you think of something, please put the question in the chat box so you remember and I'll get, I'll get to it. So um, just a little bit about our organization. Our vision is a life free of lupus. Um, here at the Lupus Foundation, we have four big areas that we focus on, which was appealing to me when I became a volunteer 15 years ago. We focus on research. We've been excited to have three new drugs um, put on the market for lupus. Education, which was like the big baby for me once I was diagnosed. We are the leader in education, especially for the patient community. We um, do advocacy and we do support, which isn't listed here. We have um, in the Southern California area, 14 groups for 2022 that will be serving virtually. So if you or someone you know needs help, they can join us via Zoom almost any day of the week throughout the month. 
So just, I like these statistics. Um, most people who hear about lupus often do think about women, but I just wanted to share some of the, the, the percentages and statistics about lupus. So about 63% of America's, Americans that follow within ages 18 to 34 really know very little about lupus or nothing at all. And this is something that those of us that are warriors of lupus often kind of feel disappointed about because we have to do a lot of explaining. First, lupus, even though it can be devastating, is really not a household name, even though it's more common than people think. 65% of patients list um, chronic pain as their most difficult aspect of lupus. Um, one in three patients will suffer with multiple autoimmune diseases which that's what lupus is. It's a chronic autoimmune disease. It can affect any part of the body. And we often say uh, it's the look good, feel bad disease because most people with lupus look perfectly fine, but you just have no idea how, how they're battling you know, within. Um, four plus doctors, that's the number of doctors many people will see on average before getting an accurate diagnosis. Um, honestly, it takes about six years, as you can see, to really receive an accurate diagnosis because people are often treated for the symptoms, not knowing the underlying cause of the things that they're, they're experiencing are lupus. So what is this? Um, when I like to explain lupus, I, I now really start with kind of going through breaking some myths. And there's three big myths about lupus. Um, lupus is a chronic autoimmune disease. And what that means is our immune system um, has some type of glitch or malfunction. It has the, it's not able to recognize the difference between what's healthy and, and um, you know, what is healthy. And so it's doing a great job of, you know, protecting us. Our immune system is like our warrior system. It's the protector of us and anything that doesn't belong in the body, it's going to make sure it's not there. So we're always exposed to things, um, bacteria, viruses, the immune system protects us from those that are harmful to us. But when you have lupus, your immune system is overactive and it can't distinguish the difference between what's healthy and what's not healthy. So it will attack both, causing inflammation in the area or damage, and anything is gained in the body. It doesn't have a specific pattern. Um, from person to person, it will vary. It can um, you know, range from mild to severe, so it will attack whatever. And so some of the key organs are your skin, your joints, and it loves the kidney. For whatever reason, that's one of the organs that's commonly affected. So what it is, I've kind of done the rundown. It's heterogeneous, so it means it can be different from person to person. Stephanie and I both have lupus, but when you really look at how we've been impacted, it's kind of different. So there's common things, but you know each person is different. And then it's unpredictable, which means you know you could be going along one day and doing fine. The next day, you can barely get out of bed, or you have something happen to you that causes you not to be able to do certain activities well. So that means it go, it flares up and it can go in remission. It can, you know, pop up and then go, you know, be calm. And this can go on, you know, throughout a person's lifetime. The pattern even varies from person to person. So uh, everybody has kind of an individual type of experience. But what I wanna also focus on is there's the three big myths. And one of them is that it's related to cancer. Lupus is not related to cancer. Uh, like I mentioned, it's an autoimmune disease. In cancer, you know, that is where tumors develop. And uh, a lot of times people think that because people with lupus also will take chemotherapy medication. And so that's kind of where that stems from. Um, it's not contagious, not even through sexual contact or fluids or anything. And like I mentioned, this is something that is a, a problem with the immune system. It's a defect of the immune system. So it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria. People with lupus often have a tougher time trying to fight off exposures to that, but it's not something that's contagious. And lastly, it's not something related to HIV. Um, in fact, they both have issues with the immune system, but HIV is a virus, whereas lupus is not. 
And in HIV, the immune system is actually underactive. So uh, it doesn't do a good job of covering you. Whereas in lupus, our immune system is overactive. It's just like going crazy. So there are several different forms of lupus. There's four big forms. Um, the most common one is systemic lupus, erythematosus, better known as SLE. This occurs in about 70% of patients. And it's, it is commonly referred to as just lupus. Um, the cutaneous lupus is the one that's really isolated to the skin. Our skin is our largest organ. However, it's only in about 10% of most cases. Sometimes you'll see it um, abbreviated as CLE or also called discoid or skin lupus. The drug-induced lupus is also um, one that is about 10% of cases. But this is the only one that's really curable. You can't cure any form of lupus. Lupus is not something with the cure. Um, it's usually like a, an allergic reaction to a medication. So once you discontinue that medication, the symptoms of lupus go away. And then there is the neonatal lupus. This is pretty rare, um, but you know, a lot of times in the babies, the symptoms do go away over time. So I just wanted to show this visual um, of lupus. It is really one of those um, conditions. I'm gonna hide my video panel. Oh, I didn't wanna hide that. I wanted to hide the bar. Um, it is one of those conditions that literally affects the person from head to toe. And as I mentioned, anything is gained um, with this. And so I just showed you with all of the organ systems, you can see people can have all kinds of issues that happen and usually this occurs at multiple times. Also over time, like I said, I've been living with lupus 22 years now, officially diagnosed, I've, even though I know I've had it, you know, longer. You know, you can have one thing, for example, it might affect your heart and lungs when you're initially diagnosed and that might be resolved and then you look up five years later, it's affecting your skin or your eyes or you know, your reproductive system. So it's something that can evolve over time. And it, it's something that you always need to be, um, you know, focused on managing. So it's a lot of work to, to live with lupus. So just to kind of show you some of the common symptoms of lupus, <clears throat> you know, looking at this list offhand, honestly, it doesn't seem that serious, you know, till you kind of get down the kidney issues. So that's probably one of the main reasons why it takes so long fatigue. But when you talk about lupus fatigue, it's the type of tiredness that you never, ever recover. It's not like, oh, I had a, a busy weekend or I worked all week or I was traveling and I did this and that and was worn out. This is where you can rest and rest and rest and you'll never make it to 100%. You might be 95 or say even 99.9, .9, but there's always that piece where you're kind of dragging to some um, degree. And, and sadly, many people with lupus kind of learn to live that way and have little you know, coping mechanisms where they can you know, go through life, but they're always tired to some degree. Hair loss is another one. Um, a lot of times when people are first diagnosed, their hair starts falling out. That was the case with me. I just couldn't believe like, what is going on with my hair? And sensitivity to sun, one of our key uh, indicators of lupus is a butterfly symbol. And that's because you can develop a rash across the bridge of your nose and that's in relation to uh, sun. And what people often don't know is the sun actually activates your immune system and that can be really uh, serious because you know you already have an overactive immune system. Painful and swollen joints occurs in almost all cases of lupus. You will also see fevers kind of come and go that you can't really explain. Rashes. This could be you know really on any part of the body, but usually it's on the face, the scalp. Kidney problems are also a big one. People will often see you know foamy urine or uh, swelling in their extremities um, happening. And that's because lupus can affect the kidneys. And this is very, very common in the African-American community. Whether you have lupus or not, it's really important to have your kidney function uh, monitored. 
So a little bit about the skin one I mentioned with the rash, it's called the mylar rash. Um, you can see that lupus is also ca called discoid and it accounts for about the 10%. Um, but with this, this is something in people that have this, you will see like lesions, the hair loss, you might see vasculitis or ulcers. Um, it's really important to wear sunscreen, but especially if you have the cutaneous lupus, it's really, really um, important to have sunscreen protection. And even though you're black, you need sunscreen. Um, for many years, people often said, you know, black people can't I always have black people can't sunburn. Yes, they can. I grew up a swimmer and every summer I was cooked and looked like a giraffe as my skin was peeling. And that was because I would get sunburned. Now let's get down to the causes. Um, I'm so happy to see these things listed. When I first uh, was diagnosed and I came in the community and I would do awareness and explain it, I used to say, we don't know what the cause of lupus is, but today we can say what causes it. And there's three things that combine that cause lupus and that's hormones, specifically the hormone estrogen. Uh, men and women have estrogen, women have it more prevalent prevalently as men. And so this is one of the reasons why science believes that um, you see more cases of women develop lupus than men. It's about a nine to one ratio. So 90% of those diagnosed are women. Genetics, our scientists have found over 50 genes that play a part in, in the lupus development. And then the, the environmental triggers play a part too. So sun exposures, exposures to certain chemicals like silicates, even antibiotics, having an injury, like being in a car accident or falling can also you know, trigger lupus. Giving birth um, are all factors within that that can play a part. So who gets lupus? I've already touched on this. 90% of those that are living with lupus are female, but anybody can be uh, developed can develop lupus. I've even seen it in kids. The youngest person I've met with lupus was three years old. Um, so, you know, and then the oldest person I've, I've met is like 90 years old that developed lupus. So anybody can develop lupus. There's about 5 million people worldwide that are living with lupus. We see an average of 16,000 cases, which I'm very certain is more, um, a lot of times because people have, um, you know, other things kind of listed as the cause of things. You don't always have a full out report that, yes, this is lupus. So, uh, like I said, it's a nine to one ratio. The age range for lupus on average is 15 to 44. When you look at children, about 15 to 20% of those cases are children. Um, when you look at the race, lupus is two to three times more prevalent in women of color specifically African-American and Latino women. Family history, relatives of people with lupus have a five to 13% chance of developing lupus. So it's not something that you're certain to get if your sibling um, has lupus. We've even had reports of twins and only one of them develops lupus, the other doesn't. Now in African-American communities, we had a study called Lumina that uh, showed that Hispanic and African-American patients have certain uh, tendencies. <clears throat> the first one is they tend to have more severe disease. Um, I'll never forget when I did my first fundraiser in, in Inglewood, I was on the first national ad campaign for lupus and I would go to all these different communities and do you know, education about lupus. But when I got to, I was in Chile's, Almost 50% of those that I talked to, I, when they would say, oh, I know somebody with lupus, they had passed away. And that was just so you know, traumatic to me. And so when I talk to our community, I really want you guys to, to think about if you know somebody with lupus, if you're living with lupus, you have to be uh, very proactive if you're a minority with this disease. You don't have the luxury of waiting um, taking it for granted. Oh, I'll get better. I can get the medications. It's very severe when we're diagnosed with it. We also develop it earlier in life um, than most uh, races. We experience greater disease activity at the time of diagnosis, which I mentioned includes kidney problems. When I got diagnosed um, and I got to the doctor within 
three months, I had kidney failure. I had never heard of this disease and, you know, it was very, very aggressive. You can have more neurological problems like the seizures, the stroke, which I was a classic case of this. And so looking at this, I really try to hone in on our community to let them know you got to you got to know this. Um, the backside of lupus, which is a side that I feel like often goes unspoken, is it's very financially draining on people, especially if you don't have insurance. The cost of lupus on average um, that's lost is about $50,000. Um, so it says $50,000 is lost annually by each lupus patient in healthcare and lost in productivity. Many people with lupus cannot work. Only about 30 to 31% of people can continue working full time. One in four people uh, will be disabled either permanently or, or temporarily by, by lupus. Uh, many people with lupus do receive their health in, uh, benefits through government sponsored programs like Medicare, or Medicaid. And that's often a fight, even, especially when they need disability. It can be very tough to prove that. Um, $52,951 is the average annual cost of people living with severe lupus. And I mentioned the 16,000 every year, but so it's a pricey disease and it's something that can, that really needs customized care. So let's talk a little bit about the diagnosis. Um, there's not one specific test that you can take to get diagnosed with lupus. And this is unfortunate. And that's because of the diversity of the, the, the disease, you know, there's, it, it ranges and it manifests itself differently from person to person. So this is just a brief review. You may require different specialists. You definitely need a good rheumatologist on your team. You may need a cardiologist or dermatologist because remember almost any organ, pretty much any organ system, it can be affected by lupus. So the main test that's uh, given to help diagnose lupus is what's called the uh, ANA test for short. And if people, if you have a positive ANA, then it's likely that you have an autoimmune condition. And then what I like to say is you have to build your case. So when you're noticing symptoms, it's really important to write them down or make notes or gather like what's going on with you. Because in addition to this ANA test, you need to be able to say like, this is what's going on to me. And a lot of times the symptoms can be really weird. Like I was walking in the store and my leg got very weak and gave out. Or I noticed this rash popped up and then I had a patch of hair fall out. So there's not one single thing. So it's a combination of things. Urine tests are also something that are commonly used along with some of these other um, anti-tests that I like to say where they look at DNA. And uh, we actually have a test that's on the market now called Advise, which can actually monitor lupus activity. Biopsies are something else that people um, may have to help with diagnosis, like a kidney biopsy or a skin biopsy. So there's not one set way to develop lupus. It's a combination of ways to be diagnosed. I've even heard people get, uh, you know, prompted by the dentist to be checked for lupus. So it can be difficult to diagnose. I mentioned that it's not, it is heterogeneous, meaning it's different from person to person. Another thing about lupus is it can mimic other diseases. It can mimic a heart attack. It can mimic cancer. It can mimic so many different things. In fact, before I was diagnosed, I was told I had a brain tumor. I had a scan, an MRI, and they thought I had a tumor on my brain stem and it was inflammation. So you know, it can be a very tricky disease um, and it's, it's characterized by flares that come and go. It also may require multiple medical visits. So you, sometimes you go to the doctor and it's not very active and people might not believe you or, uh, you know, say, okay, well, I don't understand why you had that. So a lot of times you may need the referral to other specialists to help you figure things out. So treatments, um, we went about 50 years without no new treatment on the market. The main treatment that most people with lupus have used has been um, prednisone or Plaquenil. And it was really tough to get a new treatment. Um, 
and that the new treatment came, I believe, in 2011 um, with Ben Lissa, and that was the first ever treatment that was specifically categorized for lupus. This condition has borrowed so many medications from other uh, specialties that, you know, it was tough to have lupus specific um, treatments. But the goals of any lupus treatment are to reduce inflammation, to suppress that overactive immune system, help prevent flares, and control symptoms, especially joint pain and fatigue, and minimize damage to organs. So one of the things I often tell people when they're newly diagnosed, please stick to your medication regimen because it does protect those organs. So as I mentioned, we had Benlista uh, approved. This is a rundown of um, the FDA approved therapies. You can see in 1948, aspirin was used. That was the treatment. Then we had corticosteroids come along in that same year, specifically prednisone. And I have to say prednisone is really, it's a steroid. It's a very good medication. The problem is, is when people take it over time, it can be damaging to your you know, joints and tendons. And then Ben Lista was our breakthrough. We have Plaquenil that came in 55, but this was our breakthrough. I actually was very fortunate to be one of the people to testify to the FDA about this medication. And it's made a huge difference um, over time for our lupus community and even has been shown to treat lupus nephritis, which is when lupus affects the kidneys. Um, other treatments that are used um, are NSAIDs, acetaminophen, um, Imuran is another common one. And then um, blood disorders can commonly be in lupus. So anticoagulants such as Coumadin or heparin are often used too. Now, in addition to all of this, what's really important to living uh, a quality life with lupus is making some lifestyle changes. And I think this is the Toughest thing for most people with lupus, um, I have to say, what if you have lupus, you're not a wimpy person. You have to be really tough. And it's kind of like my mom says, she's like, I've never met a lazy uh, lupus person. And I think part of the, the qualification when you have it is you're an overachiever, you're a busybody, you are taking on a lot of responsibilities. So you have to really pay attention to uh, protecting yourself from the sun and, and things, but stress. This right here is the big baby. And that, and that can happen for anybody. Stress kills if it goes unmanaged. Um, and you have to learn how to rest. You have to learn to say no. You have to learn to stop and listen to your body because it will send you over the edge into the flares. Um, you do need to be open and honest with your doctor and tell them what's going on and what symptoms you're experiencing so that they can have and create a true, uh, truly effective treatment plan for you. Exercise and eating a balanced diet plays a part. Um, and you do often have to customize your diet based on what's going on with your lupus. So that's the overview of that. Oh my God, I didn't realize I was in this slide, but the overview of um, lupus, we have so many things to offer. One of our signature events that raises money for all the work we do and, and especially supporting research is our, our national walk to end lupus. We've been doing it virtually, but here in California, we actually host three different walks throughout counties, Orange County, San Diego, and LA County. We are on the hill advocating. We actually have a caucus on the floor that now advocates for policies to help people with lupus. And we do a national summit. This year will be in June. We're hoping to be able to do that in person. But if you can't go, we have a virtual platform where you can contact your congressional officials about funding um, lupus. You can, of course, donate. You can do your own uh, fundraiser. But the most important is talk about it. I am so proud of you all for doing this and taking the time to learn about lupus so that you can pass it on and tell people about this. Some of the programs we have to offer, one of my favorite is the National Resource Center on Lupus. Um, get educated, take the time, go to lupus.org. That's where you can find it. Um, this is a collection of up-to-date resources. It's like the one-stop shop. Whether you think you might have lupus, whether you're newly diagnosed, if you're a caregiver, if you're a doctor, 
whatever, wherever you fall, you can get information right here. We have videos, we have things you can download in one place. We do a podcast called the Expert Series where we have doctors and medical experts do talks that can help people with day-to-day -day management. We also have an on, a 24 seven online platform called Lupus Connect. We have about 17,000 people that are in here. You can connect with other people living with lupus. You can do the Take Charge, which is an email series. Everything on here is free. And then you have the National Health Educator Network. And these are people that are nurses. I even have an MD that can talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. You can call or email and they can connect with you. And we have a questionnaire to help reduce that diagnosis time. If people think they're having symptoms, they can go to Could It Be Lupus and do this questionnaire and even take it into a doctor. So thank you all so much for listening. If you have any questions, comments, I will be glad to answer them or share anything else that you might have on your mind. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna go to the chat box, let's see. Okay, so for Patricia, she says, thank you for sharing your story, Wendy. How are you now after your transplant? You know, Patricia, I'm doing so well. I feel so blessed because my lupus has been what's in called, called remission. So I have very, very few, almost non-existent um, activity of lupus. Um, but I do, I do take a lot of medications. I take, you know, a lot of um, like immunosuppressive medications. So the flip side of that is, you know, not necessarily managing flares, is really trying to protect myself. Um, like in this pandemic, protecting myself is like really at the top of my list because when people take immunosuppressive medications for lupus, it's harder for them to fight off. Um, like a, getting a cold or getting the flu, it takes a person a lot longer and they have a tougher time. So it's, it's more of that than anything else. Okay, is there a test, Wendell asked, is there a test for lupus or is it diagnosed based upon the presentation um, of symptoms just mentioned? Well, the main test, Wendell, is the ANA test. And um, if most people are having sim the symptoms listed in combination with a positive test, more than likely they have lupus. Now, you don't have to have a positive test to actually have lupus. There are cases where you know people haven't shown positive, but they actually have uh, the disease. And then there's a couple of conditions that are kind of like cousins or um, kind of like, you know, uh, imitators of lupus, but they often can form, uh, fall in that symptom. And one of them is fibromyalgia and mixed connective tissue disease. So a lot of times people who have those um, autoimmune diseases, they have very similar symptoms. Um, to lupus and often are benefit from, you know, our education and our treatment plans. Did this help you? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Actually, I wanted to ask you how, how accessible is that medication, that newest uh, treatment that you mentioned? How accessible is that? The Benlista? Yeah, to our, in our community, do you have any idea what percentage of uh, lupus patients are, are able to get that drug or are receiving it? You know, with just like with any medication, when it first came out um, in 2011, 11, it was tough to, for, to access. And one of the things that made Benlista tough to uh, access is that it wasn't in pill form, it's an infusion. So you honestly have to go into a clinic to get it, like get hooked to an IV and everything. Some people based on their insurance, as you may know, it's, it was a fight to get it approved, especially because of the way it was administered. But now we have it where you can actually administer it yourself. The company is GlaxoSmithKline and they're actually one of our partners. And so they do have um, benefits and discount programs for people to access lupus. Um, we also have a person on our health education um, staff that can help people with their insurance and understanding insurance and going through what they need to make sure it's approved. So there, there are loopholes around that and, you know, to get to that. But now I think it's a lot better to access it now that it's been out on the market a while. It was tough at first. I'll be open and honest. Yeah. 
when I listen to you say uh, all the struggles that you have had, mm -hmm. you're amazing. <laughs> you are amazing. A you know what? I'll be honest. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. nothing but the good Lord that has yeah. kept me. And I, I know that. I clearly know that. I'm just glad I'm here to share this. Yeah, we, we're really uh, thankful that you were able to share with us as well. Uh, it's been an eye opener for me. Uh, we've known, we know what struggle Stephanie goes through uh, yeah. all the time. Uh, but I remember even before when Stephanie was suffering, even before her diagnosis, or because she and I have always had this relationship when I just mm -hmm. say, you know, some, I, I remember saying to Reverend Rebus one day, something is just not right. With right. It's just this frequent to the doctor and they don't know and they telling us yeah. got this and that and it's not it was oh it was mine but I know Stephanie remembers that mm, crazy so, yes it mm -hmm. was crazy and I think what if I remember correctly Stephanie it was a rash on your arm that they finally paid attention to mm. <laughs> that that was, the, the combination of the rash and I had went from uh, a bad cold to right. bronchitis yep. to pneumonia and I was in the hospital with pneumonia and uh, the, the lung doctor uh, he said I don't want to scare you but have you had a rash before and I pointed my arms to him and he could see the rash was still there and he said I'm yeah. sending you to a rheumatologist because mm -hmm. I believe you have lupus and that yeah. was the journey yeah mm -hmm. the beginning of the journey yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's probably the, one of the biggest frustrations is, you know, like looking at Stephanie, I'm sure you wouldn't know. Um, and, and things often do linger um, in, in many cases, like the rashes, but then it's almost like when you are trying to get diagnosed, you have to go in where it's very, when it's very active for mm -hmm. me, it was easy to really get diagnosed. Um, the frustrating part, when I walked into the doctor, what happened to me is I had the symptoms of like hair loss. I was swelling. I had rashes um, and I was so, so tired. But I just thought, OK, I moved across the country. I'm doing all this stuff. I was working full time. I decided to go do a master's. I, was, I just never rested. And it was almost like I hit the wall. I had like this one time with weakness. I couldn't even push myself out of the bathtub. And then finally, one morning, I woke up to take my daughter to her uh, basketball game, and I couldn't even lift my head from the pillow. And that's what scared me so bad, because I had never had a serious health um, problem. I played all kind of sports, was all kind of, was very active, had a natural childbirth. And so when I saw that happen to me, I was like, something is really wrong with me. I know it now, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I got to the doctor, and when I walked in, and they took my vitals, my blood pressure was 225 over 125, just ready to have a stroke at any moment. I was 27 at the time. And so I never even got to the conversation of like, why do you have that high blood pressure? It was just assumed because I was an African-American woman that I might not be eating well or taking care of myself. I'm not the skinniest person, but it was just automatically assumed, you know, that this was wrong with me not even doing any further, uh, you know, search as to why I had the high blood pressure in my 20s. So that's very common for people with lupus, you got to get the band aid. And so I went through about three different um, blood pressure treatments, and none of them were controlling the blood pressure it would still go up, it would just still go up. And finally, I got so frustrated that I started doing my own research. And I had this women's health book at my house, and I just started looking up symptoms. And I read this very brief article that said, talked about lupus and how one of the key things that people with lupus have is joint pain. And as I backtracked, you know, the symptoms that I noticed, the very first thing I noticed that was different with my health was joint pain. I remember that was the first thing I remember being different. I would wake up every morning, very achy, trying to just get going. It's almost like I had to warm up my body and it would go away. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I asked to be tested for lupus. And that was part of the campaign we did in 2009 is encouraging, especially minority women, you know, if you're having any of these symptoms, ask, could it be lupus? Could this be lupus? Could this be lupus? And, you know, that's what happened to me. And even with the diagnosis, 
um, a few months later, I just didn't know. I ended up going on a on a trip to Palm Springs and we ended up going on this Jeep tour and they took us out of the Jeep hiking around in 114 degree weather. And I wasn't supposed to be exposed to the sun and I had no clue. So by that August, I was in ICU. So it's just things like that. When you know, you can protect yourself. And it seems so, you know, to me, it's kind of silly, like being in the sun, you know, that's kind of, you know, silly, but that's because the sun, uh, you know, ramps up your, your immune system. It helps bolster your immune system. And I didn't know anything like that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I don't know, my son's mother-in-law has lupus. She's in her 80s and she's been living with lupus. She wow. is very, she's blessed though, because she is, she literal, if she does have any symptoms, she doesn't talk about it. Yeah, she's yeah a lot of people are kind of yeah. quiet about it. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah. it's the same thing. It took them a long time to diagnose her. And, you know, this was, I don't know, 50 years ago or maybe even longer when she got mm -hmm. it. So you can imagine what she went through yeah. In terms of a diagnosis, they didn't have the same uh, no. sophistication no. As, yeah, as they, there is now, but she does very well with it. Yeah. Well, I do want to say on a positive note, even though this condition is very, can be very uh, life-changing and tough on people, uh, only about 15 to 20% of cases really pass away with serious complications. If you manage it, and you get a good medical team, you can live a long life with lupus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you really can. I've been through a lot, but I've learned that, uh, you know, with lifestyle changes and, and being, you know, compliant with medication and working with doctors, you can live a quality life. I, I, I will say I live a pretty normal life now, um, right. but it's been a lot of work and yeah. sacrifice. You know, I couldn't do what everybody else did sometimes I'd have to go home and go to bed or say no I can't do that today or pick and choose so that I can you know be okay mm -hmm. great well I certainly want to thank you so much for uh your time Wendy and uh this has been very enlightening for me and as I said it's recorded so if you missed any portion of it uh you uh ask me and I'll give you the record uh, send you the recording I'm not sure well, about the, the Facebook or YouTube. I don't know how to do that yet. So. <laughs> well, if you all ever need me, you can meet, uh, reach me via email at Rogers. That's R-O-D-G-E-R-S, like the word Dodgers, but with the R in front, at lupus.org. If you want to check out anything we have to offer, you can go to lupus.org for that information I shared. And for Southern California, all of the events and activities and information can be found at lupus.org forward slash SoCal, S-O-C-A-L. We do, we always have something going on. We have, like I said, 14 support groups. Uh, support groups are for family members, or if you just want to learn about lupus, um, we do those in the evenings. And we even have Saturday, we have one for men. We have one for the Asian community, all kind of stuff, the Latin Latino community. So we really work hard and we do education events called Lupus and You. We'll have one like this about what is lupus coming up um, on, on January 25th. So we do different topics around lupus um, for education. So if you need anything or resources, just let me know. I'll be happy to get those to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give our Thank you, applause, Wendy. everybody. This was very, very, very good. I really appreciate it. Good. I'm glad. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If, if, uh, that's a hand clap from Lisa <laughs> <laughs> and Deanne. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you so much, Wendy. And if there are no further qu other questions or comments, um, you guys go back, go on, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> okay. Thanks, okay. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. See you later, Wendy. Bye, Bye Thank Stephanie. You so much. Bye, Stephanie. Bye, you guys. Bye. 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 Thank you.